so many of us as humans are walking around taking our breath for granted without any knowledge that actually a bit of care and attention, a bit of deliberate practice can potentially yield some quite dramatic benefits, right? Well, we breathe, the average person breathes about 25,000 times a day. And most of us aren't thinking about any of those breaths. We take in 30 pounds of air into our lungs and out of our lungs every single day. Once we take control of this unconscious ability to breathe, we can then harness all of the power within that and use it to do some incredible things. Some things that scientists thought were absolutely impossible have been proven to be absolutely possible by focusing on your breathing. And it really feels like right now we're at this moment where we have the instruments, we have the interest to really study breathing and to prove how it's working, how it alters our minds and our bodies and how it can benefit us. So, so what's going on? When someone breathes through their nose compared to their mouth, what is going on and why does it make such a difference? So when we breathe through our nose, we are humidifying air, we're pressurizing air, we are filtering that air out and we're conditioning it so that by the time that air gets to our lungs, it can more easily be absorbed and we can extract oxygen from it. So we know this, this, is, this has been proven time and time again, and yet about 25 to 50% of the population habitually mouth breathes. And when you mouth breathe, you get none of those benefits. You can almost think of the lungs as an external organ when you're mouth breathing, right? They're exposed to everything in your environment. And if you live in a city like I do, I don't want to expose my lungs to all those allergens and pollutants. So the quickest way of filtering air and conditioning it is this wondrous organ right in the front of our faces called the nose. And it is completely underappreciated and underused in society. How did you become a nose breather? And is it possible for anyone to actually listen to this and go, okay, I hear you, James, there's all these benefits. I want those benefits. How do I start? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember breathing through my mouth as a kid. I see pictures of myself when I was young and I'm breathing through my mouth. Not all the time, but it definitely happened. And even until adulthood, I thought it was normal just to go to sleep with a pint of water by my bed every single night to wake up every few hours with a dry mouth, take a swig of water, go back to sleep. I did that for decades till I met Dr. Jayak or Nyack down at Stanford. And he said, this isn't normal at all. We should be breathing through our nose all the time, especially during sleeping hours. That's a third of your life. And if you're breathing through the mouth, you're just exposing yourself to everything in your environment. And also you're loosening the tissues at the back of your throat and making yourself more apt to snore and have sleep apnea, which is another thing that, that blew my mind. So, you know, once you realize how dangerous mouth breathing is, you can then take a conscious effort to change it, how you're doing, how you're breathing throughout the day. But that won't help you when you're unconscious at night, right? So, so once I learned this, I was shutting my mouth all the time, practicing nasal breathing. At the beginning, it was very difficult. I felt very congested here, but the nose is a use it or lose it organ. I also learned that from, from Stanford, that the more you use it, the more it's gonna open up. Those tissues are gonna acclimate and open up. So I focused on that and at night, this sounds a little crazy, uh, but I used a little piece of tape, uh, which I still do just on my lips to train my mouth shut at night. And uh, this sounds a little, you know, like, like new age science, but it's, but it's not because I heard from a breathing therapist at Stanford, Ann Kearney, who had used it herself and uses it for her patients. I talked to other researchers who did the same thing. Um, and that has helped me tremendously and it's helped so many other people as well. And it's free. Yeah. Hey, James, look, I, I'm, I'm totally with you on that. It, it is incredible, the difference. In fact, I actually spoke to a buddy this morning on the phone who I've not spoken to for a few months. And I said, Hey, he was saying, how's the podcast going? I said, yeah, great. I'm actually speaking to someone, James Nestor this afternoon. You've got to get his book. It's just incredible. It's all about breathing. And he said to me that the thing he's changed a few months ago um, was he started to tape his mouth up at night. 
And he said he cannot believe the difference. He said, I don't wake up thirsty. I'm not groggy in the morning. I've got more energy, better cognition, you know. And, and I think for people who are skeptical, and I know they are out there, they're, they're, even within my own family, they're skeptics to how important breathing is. I think it really is quite profound what you can feel like. You may not even know how good you can feel until you start breathing in a more optimal way. Um, but if you talk, when you talk about tape over your mouth, some people will think, will probably feel claustrophobic and the thought of actually taping their mouth shut probably is going to scare them. But, but you would say it's not like that, is it? No. And, and just to, to second what you were saying, it's one thing to have a subjective experience and say, hey, I feel better after taping. And that means something, right? But it's another thing to measure this stuff. If we can measure it, we can study it. If we can study it, we can figure out if it's actually working. And that's exactly what we did work, working with, with NIAC at Stanford. So the measurements from these instruments aren't going to lie. Yes, I felt better. But to me, as a science journalist, it's much more convincing to have data. Because what works with one person may not work with somebody else. And that's, they're finding right now that Stanford and Kearney is booting up a study of 200 people looking at sleep apnea and snoring and sleep tape. And uh, I so happen to have a little role here. Um, and I want to explain to people that don't, I would highly suggest not going on YouTube and looking how to sleep tape because there's a lot of really sketchy stuff there. All you need is a teeny piece of tape. I use a piece that big. It's about half the size of a postage stamp and I put it right across my lips. I can still talk to you. I can still breathe from my mouth if, if I want, but it just reminds me when I'm unconscious to keep my jaw shut and I can take it off with my tongue. So this is not a hostage situation, duct tape kind of thing. This is a teeny piece of tape just to train the mouth shut. And just anecdotally, I've received several dozen emails from people who have had chronic snoring for the past few decades, who have had even mild or moderate sleep apnea, and they've recorded their sleep and they no longer suffer from those things. So that's not psychosomatic. It's not a placebo effect. That's what happens when you close your mouth and you allow that air to be pressurized, push the soft tissues further back in your airway and open them up to breathe more efficiently. You get 20% more oxygen through a nasal breath than you do through a mouth breath. And if you think that's not going to affect you over the long term, you're, you're nuts. It will have a tremendous effect on your health. How we breathe absolutely affects us. It even affects the density of our bones. It affects us down to the atomic level, subatomic level with electrons. So to to think that how we breathe does not matter is not based in any real science. You know, people think that since I studied breathing for so many years, I'd be the best breather in the world, and I'm, I'm not. I've got a lot of work to do. Um, but at least the, the first step about breathing is to be conscious of it and, and to understand that this isn't something that should just be running in the background, in the back of our minds but something that we can take control of. So I'm acutely aware of when I'm breathing improperly and I'm acutely aware of then how to fix it. So more intense breath work practices, I will do about three or four times a week, usually at night, but throughout the, do throughout the day, I'm adopting very simple, healthy breathing habits. And that, that to me is, is one of the most important things about this. This isn't asking people to go out and run six miles a day or to completely change their lifestyle. You can adopt healthy breathing practices anywhere. And we know that there's a solid foundation of science between all of these things. We have seen people absolutely transform by adopting simple breathing habits. This is not a placebo effect. It's absolutely real. And I'm convinced I've experienced this myself. I've talked to dozens and dozens of people who have also experienced it. I've talked to the leaders in the field who have introduced me to all of their data. And I, I find that this is an underappreciated and underacknowledged aspect of our health, but that's starting to change and it couldn't happen sooner, especially right now in the midst of a pandemic, focusing on your breathing can really have some transformative effects.
If you enjoyed that clip from my podcast, here's another powerful clip that is really going to help you with your health and happiness. Breathing is the life force and you are able to stop it, to manipulate it. Take them on guys, because you will be ready to take on any stressor in the world.